uh, for anyone who has not met me. Uh, my name is Andrea Vasquez. Uh, in addition to being a theology concentrator, I'm one of the two psychology majors that are going to be um, discussing my capstone with you guys. Um, so I'm going to be discussing the link that I have discovered um, between phenomenology, natural law, as well as counseling, and how I believe this discussion can be helpful in understanding and addressing the psychological phenomenon of shame. So in the secular world, at least, uh, there is much disagreement uh, regarding whether there is an objective standard of morality, especially um, when it's in the regarding uh, yeah actions that don't cause harm to someone or that uh, supposedly don't affect others. So um, I believe this results from various understandings of the law um, and how they relate to human nature. So there's some that of course view it as imposed onto human nature and thus um, opposed to this nature. Um, however, recognizing moral law as the humans as the human person's essential duties and right to live according to his nature allows for a proper phenomenological understanding of the experience of shame, uh, recognition of how it is regulatory of man's relation to his sin, as well as an understanding of the higher calling that our innate aversion to sin is directing us to, which I believe can be achieved through counseling and related psychological assessment. Um, so in things, According to nature, the rule defining their proper order of their existence is the force inclining them to their end, according to Aquinas. So in the case of humans, this is the natural law that was divinely inscribed within them by our creator. Um, and this must be so because even when no one's around to witness or judge an act, there will be feelings of discomfort and incongruence that very often follow the inaction of immoral acts. So, a phenomenological study that I conducted for my thesis as a psych major revealed that this exact condition is uh, inherent to the experience of shame. So in feeling ashamed and, and concerned about their appearance, one realizes that in a sense, some parts of their self is not up to them solely. So um, yes, as psych majors, we are tasked with studying the distinctions between quantitative and qualitative analysis and understanding that while they're both um, equally valuable because of their distinct methods. Uh, they have access to information about psychological phenomena that the other doesn't. Um, there is much quantitative studies in the literature regarding shame, but this uh, understands deterministically by isolating variables, some of which were displayed over here based on my research of the literature. Um, and they study these relationships in terms of cause and effect, mediation, correlation, things of that sort. So while this is certainly valuable, the phenomenological qualitative analysis, um, rather, um, it allows us to explore what these experiences mean rather than asking, um, trying to explain them, essentially. And um, we can explore how they are subjectively lived by individual persons in light of their intentionality, which I will also explain a little later. Um, so in my analysis, uh, I studied the phenomenon of shame by way of the access question I asked of my participant, which was to tell me of a situation when they were concerned about another's perception of them. Who I was talking to was a young lady who was going to be attending a conference and her ex-boyfriend was gonna be there. So she just kind of uh, talked me through the situation from beginning to end. So by way of this phenomenological qualitative research method and using this description that I was provided, I found five conditions to be inherent to the experience of shame including this second aforementioned moment, forgive uh, the font, but um, this in the fact that uh, in feeling ashamed, some parts of the individual self is again not up to them solely. So regardless of whether, uh, whether or not another, one, another person is incarnately present, the mere possibility of another's perception of the individual, and especially the fact that uh, this perception could be other than what was originally intended, it creates a sense of uneasiness or shame that often leads to depression, self-criticism, body image, control, behaviors, and other related behaviors, which is what I saw in the literature. Um, so I considered uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's image of the keyhole to make sense of this moment when one is confronted with the possibility of their self or another. So before uh, one is completely engulfed in their act so that their consciousness has no transcendent reference or recognition of itself, but um, this is then interrupted by the look, which those throws them out of their self, wherein seeing the other that could be watching them is synonymous with the experience of being seen by the other. The other's existence, even if merely imagined, serves only to affirm the potential of one's self to be the object of another's perception. 
Thus, this image contextualizes the discomfort naturally arising from being caught in an immoral act as if in being caught looking through a peephole that, I would argue, demonstrates the natural law and conscience that all humanity is endowed with. When acting when uh, in accordance with our nature, it is deemed right and moral because this action doesn't swerve from the order of its active principle to the end. But when it does stray from this rectitude, it comes under the notion of sin, again from Aquinas. So this nat natural negative uh, reaction following sin is characterized by a sense of defect or disintegration wherein one feels inadequate or lacking some type of completeness. This is so because in disordered action, that which is pursued is merely perceived as good. And so it would naturally follow that a sense of true satisfaction and fulfillment is never reached. Um, so rather what results is shame. This uh, illustrates what phenomenological philosophy understands to be intentionality, which is that by which we perceive and uniquely color the sensible world around us. Um, so this co-constitutive presence that the individual always brings to the act of perception, it, it refers to the role that their mode of directionality, which is here the noesis, kind of how they're directed towards the image that is then um, perceived and made present to their consciousness, which is called noema, according to Husserl, another phenomenologist. phenomenologist. Um, so an example of this in terms of, yeah, the moral or immoral act would be abortion. So the noema, that is the image that is perceived would be the fact that it's, it's moral. Someone might believe that abortion is indeed moral. But the noesis, the directionality, the uh, precon preconceptions uh, with which they approach this, um, yeah, this image and this topic, of, it would be like, you know, with our understanding of what the procedure is, um, when life starts, uh, any exceptions that make this more illicit. So uh, phenomenology can be employed to understand how an individual can come to the conclusion by the acts of intentionality that certain ends, even if objectively immoral ends, um, ought to be pursued as good or at least can be deemed as illicit. So this is certainly valuable in understanding how different people's consciences come to exist how they do. Um, but moral theology and an understanding of natural, natural law reveals that regardless of the subjective experiences and values that people come to hold by way of this formation, there are objective standards that we opt to follow, even if psychologically challenging. This innate sense of the natural law within the individual um, that they implicitly know that they are falling short of refutes modern attempts to understand law as something imposed from without and at odds with our nature. So conscience and the law it subordinates itself to is therefore a product of formation from within our being that signifies the demanding truth in the subject himself, as Ratzinger said in On Conscience, um, and it's certainly not one of human forces. Uh, conscience uh, thus doesn't result from a sort of autonomy which is subjectively constructed through the individual's volition um, that can then serve as a sort of oracle that uniquely determines each individual's set of values, a la relativism. Rather, the conscience is an organ that belongs to our essence and is endowed with a proper manner of functioning. Thus, it can't be understood in the context of a heteronomy that renders it distinct from our nature, but it should be understood as a participated theonomy, um, wherein our free obedience to the law allows us to participate in God's wisdom and partake, partake in our genuine freedom to flourish. Therefore, um, action incongruent with the natural law inscribed within us results in shame within the soul as it experiences the body acting against its form. However, this discord is purposeful in the way that it aims to call man's attention to their ill-faring soul. Specifically, it allows them to be preoccupied um, with their specific transgression and how they should go about undoing their deed and, I believe, overcoming these unhealthy tendencies and attitudes. So, he knows the act is at odds with his identity, which was referenced earlier in terms of the phenomenological conditions undergirding the experience of shame, and is thus naturally inclined to rectify this. Um, even if it's easier said than done. The piece being sought for here is the interior gaze as is discussed by John Paul II. He desires to be in that state of perfection before the fall where he didn't experience a rupture between the spiritual and the sensible, nor did this cloud his ability to see through to the dignity of his fellow man. So alas, in light of the loss of the gaze, man can't naturally understand the link between his God-given nature and his comportment nor can he recognize um, and trust that he will be um, seen in this way by others, um, which is what I have here. 
So um, yeah, resulting is the phenomenon of shame that we subject others to by way of our fallen perception while also fearing our potential subjection to it. Psychology thus understands shame as a self-conscious emotion, for in it, man doesn't evaluate his worth and dignity by that which was divinely inscribed within him, but instead subjects himself to a faulty gaze which condemns from without. He's unaware of his true identity and he can't trust in the possibility of being known apart from his misdeeds. He might think that renouncing his sin is hopeless, um, and this echoes the physicalist notion wherein the body is viewed as raw datum to be used and passively shaped by act. Um, nonetheless, we're relational beings meant to commune, and thus in shame we manifest our instinctive need to be affirmed according to our rightful value. So, um, yeah, man's lack of recognition of his identity as a son of the father, combined with the world's tendency to relegate his dignity to his act, um, results in another dimension of shame, where man is identified with a sin by which he strayed from, uh, strayed from his nature, that is. So, um, yeah, I... I read a really wonderful um, article by Austriaco, um, and this quote, um, yeah, entailed that shame engages one's sense of self and means that uh, man's only options are to either assimilate into a community where he can experience a semblance of acceptance by avoiding judgment of his inclinations, or he can hide away in shame, which is also never to participate in true communion with others. Um, these distinct reactions to the voice of conscience are instinctual to man as a social being, and psychologists propose that shame is utilized by individuals for facilitating group dynamics for the sake of preserving long-term survival, um, other interpersonal relationships that anchor human communities. Um, and I saw this in an article uh, regarding post-abortive shame. So the fact that the attempt to lower the shame of these women um, after abortion didn't have to do with her personal perceptions, but instead had to do with those around her, I believe reveals uh, the relational dimension to this phenomenon where we fear being perceived uh, as something we innately know we ought not to be. Um, so instead, the discomfort experienced in the aftermath, uh, aftermath of moral acts should call attention to the natural law we were designed with and allow for our reintegration and thus our return unto communion with the divine. So um, yeah, understanding our identity and the natural law we were designed with not only makes clear our responsibilities, but it also invites us into reconciliation with he who, despite our folly, calls us is and wants to restore the sonship that we lost through sin. Um, the proven success of psychotherapeutic techniques and counseling and attending to the mental and emotional suffering resulting from um, what they call unproductive behaviors ought to prompt recognition of these approaches as tools and clinicians as shepherds, which the father can employ to bring about our healing. After all, it is he who, faithful to his love for man, gives him his law in order to restore man's original and peaceful harmony with the creator and to draw him into his divine love. Thank you. <laughs> that felt like a lot. <laughs> um, yes, especially like distinguishing between the word conscience and conscious. I hope y'all follow with that. Yes, any questions? <laughs> So I just want to say, man, there's there's so much there to, to comment on, but um, what comes to mind is um, I'm thinking about confessors who probably experience this phenomenon where somebody confesses a sin and you have the healing grace of the sacrament and, and you can overcome the guilt of it, but there's a residual shame that remains that sometimes makes penitents want to reconfess the same thing over and over. So I'm just curious, like, like there's a role for the church in this and the sacramental grace and what they can do. But there's also this role for psychology. And so can you share a little bit more about like, what are the psychological resources to help people reintegrate? Because to, to persist in this feeling of shame that, that happens when there's this incongruence also isn't healthy. And so what does psychology offer for us? And maybe how could that even help confessors or, or others, in, you know, involved in pastoral care of souls. For sure, um, that's that's what I loved about um, the connection of my major psychology with theology because I feel that um, as I was trying to illustrate with my presentation is that theology lays down the objective truths of our nature and of reality that all other um, healthcare and any other ministries needs to can help conform and aid humans in re uh, reintegrating into. And so, whereas um, confessors indeed can help us 
you know, that, that act of grace that does um, banish our sin and certainly can provide um, a sort of comfort to um, he who is confessing because of the way that we just can't love ourselves and that we are, as I said, very suspicious of, of even if it's, a, if, if it's the divine, we're suspicious of the ability of any being to love us in spite of our folly because our folly is really despicable. Um, I think that's when psychologists and, and counselors and therapists and the whole plethora ought to uh, step in and concretely walk through and in a way enact this phenomenological analysis where they can understand how this person came to these conclusions that led to their experience of shame. Um, and then almost so similarly to your presentation, Madison, um, once this is expounded upon and you're um, accompanying them and you're stepping into their situation, it's only then when that leadership can take place and you, you can start providing resources or enacting cognitive behavioral therapy or um, whatever, if it's post-traumatic stress disorder, things of that sort, that's when um, these more concrete therapies can be introduced. And I think it definitely would benefit confessors and those in ministry just to at least have an awareness of these resources, um, how they work, and to be able to speak to those things when patients um, are seeking it out, even if implicitly, even if not explicitly asking for that. Uh, thank you. I, I think that question is true. Yeah. Um, but uh, also, um, so a comment and a question. So the comment, um, there's a philosopher in Austin, a natural law philosopher named J. Bojczewski, who has a book called The Revenge of Conscience that sounds a lot like what you're talking about. I don't, if you haven't looked at it, I think you would enjoy it. Yeah, Dr. Wallace also said the exact same thing when I told him about this, so I will look into it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and the question is, so I was, I was intrigued by your qualitative research mm -hmm. um, within the psychology major, and it sounds like that did not have to do with moral shame with your research subject in particular. Um, and I was just curious, you know, if the tools of qualitative psychological research could be used to, to des design some kind of research project on moral shame and what, what you would want that to look like. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly in my limitations of my 34 page thesis, which are more can relate, it's so long and insane and so tedious. So glad to be done with it. But um, <laughs> in my limitations, I certainly stated that um, I don't know if I would want to do the research, but it would. Uh, we would definitely benefit from just um, being able to read more descriptions and from different types of individuals and different circumstances. Um, and I think it would be super interesting to focus in on people who do have uh, and under some sort of moral compass and who do describe their shame specifically as in, in terms of morality and their values. And um, I guess in, in that analysis, how it would be taken up is um, maybe even exploring their formation, how they went about um, understanding these values, whether it was church or their parents or, or this or that. I suppose that um, these we would integrate those questions in the access question when like asking about their description. And then the phenomenological analysis um, would, would follow through after that. Thank you.